In which war did you serve? Korean War. Um, which branch of service were you in? The Navy. What was your highest rank? Uh, third class petty officer in boot camp. Where did you serve? Uh, the East Coast. Uh, I was all over Europe, all over the East Coast. Uh, I was out of Newport, Rhode Island, and we went to the Mediterranean for six months, and we were down in Cuba for about three or four months and stuff like that. Then I got discharged. I got out. I got out two years early. I didn't go through the full four years. Can you hear me on that? How did you get out uh, two years early? Because uh, I fooled them. I had a heart condition. Okay. I got a systolic murmur. Okay. I'm 80 years old. I was supposed to die a long time ago, but I told them I'm not going. I'm not I'm ready yet. You're sticking around. I knew you guys were going to start interviews, so I hung around for this. Good. <laughs> so how did you decide to go into the Navy? Were you drafted? No, I wanted to get away from my father. <laughs> he owned a restaurant in New Haven, and I was his per personal slave. We, we, 24 hours a day, you know, and I, you go to school, you got out of school, you're right home, you can't do anything. I owned a car, I couldn't drive around, I couldn't take a girl home. If I did, I'd be in trouble. So oh, no. I went in there just to get away and have a life. That's the only reason I went in, not for any glory at all. What was the name of the restaurant? Is it still Arts there? Cottage Restaurant. No, it's in Mars Cove in New Haven, Connecticut. It goes, it was, we had it for 30, about 32 years. And when I came back, I didn't go to work on it. I got married and came up here. How, do, how did you feel when you first entered boot camp? Did you do boot camp uh, training? Like, what were the emotions that you felt? Well, when you go into boot camp, you have no emotions because you don't know what the hell is going to happen. You don't know what they're going to do. You know, they're going to are they going to shoot us here or what they're going to do? You're supposed to be in training. Most of it, we did marching and things like that. I was made third class petty officer in, in boot in boot camp, and I was in charge of all the prisoners. In other words, I had to make sure we. I lined these guys up, we went to chow together, and none of them ran off or got away. So that was my responsibility. Uh, I got court martial in boot camp too a couple of times. The things you weren't supposed to you know, it, it's, it's uh, how should I say this? If you're going in there for glory, and it's hard, it's work. It's like working a job. You gotta march, you gotta carry a rifle, you gotta learn. But the guy that uh, was over us was very easy. You know, it was really a, f a good time. I enjoyed it. You met a lot of guys. We were in the barracks with a bunch of guys. I don't know if I should say this or not, but we were in a, we had a group from Kentucky, guys who came in here to go because now they they weren't that educated in Kentucky, uh, and we were playing. We were always pranksters. That's the big thing in the boot camp. We told them they they never saw a toilet in their life. And they were, looked at them and they asked us what they were. We told them they were Bendix foot washers. And they says, what, what's a Bendix? I said, you wash your feet in it. <laughs> <laughs> they were flushing it until I found out they were flushing their feet in it. So I didn't do too many of that. I was, you know, I was just stayed on my own at the time. That's funny, though. So after boot camp, you went directly into the Korean War, where did you No, go after boot camp you go into, uh, well I went to, right to, right to the ship, you go right to, right to your station, and the ship was my station. There was a, a I guess there were about 10 of us that uh, were assigned to the Abbott, from the, two, two of the guys are from Waterbury, Johnny Bly and Wally Colby, and we were all on the same ship. Uh, some scatter all over, some go to schools, they wanted me to go to officer's training, but I didn't want to. Uh, on board ship, and you know, I went on board ship to get away from people, so I didn't want to rank. Yeah. So I used to chip paint. Oh. So the, and then I, when I wasn't hiding in the, in the life jacket locker, I'd go to sleep in there, and then I'd come up with time to eat. <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> what type of uh, things did your boat do? Like, were you? We were, we were, we were a plane guard for the aircraft carriers, and basically, what a destroyer is in the navy. If, if a torpedo is shot at a, at, a, at a large ship, either a carrier or, or a battleship or something like that, it's our position to take that torpedo. In other words, we have to get in front of it, between the ship and that. And that was our job. And we used to refuel off the carrier. I don't know if you've ever seen waves that were uh, like 10 stories high. 
in the ocean. You're in the ocean and you got an aircraft carrier that goes up on the top of that wave and it's like the Empire State Building. That aircraft carrier is up there and you're down in a hole. And then you start reversing positions and stuff like that. We used to refuel off the carrier. That's how we kept the ships going. The carrier had most of the fuel and they would drop a fuel line to us and there were a lot of comedians on the carrier. We plugged the fuel line in and while we were staying, we couldn't leave. We had to stay there and hold it and make sure it stayed plugged in while we were there and the water got in. And as the ship, ships are running side by side, the wake of the carrier is hitting the side of the destroyer. The destroyer, the water is going from your middle of your knees up to here and then down. It just keeps doing that till you're through filling the thing up. You don't know when the hell it's going to go over where your head. Where are you standing with it? On the deck, right on the main deck. On the main deck. That's where the, the that's Abbott? yeah, right on the Abbott. On the main deck is where the plug is that you fill with the, the edge with oil. And the guy when they when we released the thing, the guys on the carrier were a bunch of comedians. We got the tube out, refueled, covered it, and they turned the thing on and covered it, sprayed us all with oil, just to, as a joke. You know, to them. That's that's not funny. You know, well, to them it was funny, but to me, I would have, it's a good thing I was way down there. I had oil. What ocean was that in? Pacific. The Pacific Ocean. Worst place in the Pacific Ocean is Cape Hatteras. That's where the uh, Navy don't like, uh, sailors don't like. Very, very rough because that's where the warm and the cold come together and boy, is it rough in there. So where did your boat go? We went from uh, Newport, Rhode Island. First trip was down to uh, uh, Cuba. And we were down to Cuba for probably two months or something like that. In those days, we could go in, in, down to Havana and all that. We weren't, uh, or whatever the closest city was. It wasn't like nowadays where, you know, Castro's in there. He wasn't around in those days when I was in there. So we were very friendly with the Cuban people. It was, it was nice. And then we went to, uh, we, we came back. We went to Europe. Uh, I was, uh, uh, we had officers on board that I, you know, there was one guy that was, I, I don't know what the hell his problem was, but I had a week's pass. We were going to Europe for six months, and my mother and father divorced, you know, from the restaurant business, and my mother married another gentleman, so we were going to move the f move furniture for her because he was, uh, he, had Al he had Alzheimer's and he couldn't do anything. So I had a week's pass signed by an officer and signed by the captain and commodore of the ship, and the day, two days before I was supposed to go on leave to help my help them pack because we were in at the end of the week we were going to Europe and we wouldn't be back for eight months. Uh, they canceled my leave, and I says you can't do that. I says you got to it's your writing. They said they don't care. They changed their division. So this officer was they had it in for me. He said we put you in, and I said well where did you put me? What division? She said, you're in the third division, and I kind of looked at it quick without saying anything, and I says you're absolutely sure that I can't get my leave. He says yep. I said, you're absolutely sure that I'm in the third division? I asked him five times. I made him say it in front of the other officer. You're absolutely sure? And he says, yes. I says, fine, because I have a 48-hour pass. The guy almost fainted, put me in the wrong division. I went and took my 48 hours plus a week <laughs> when, this, when it came, when the ship came. Well, when it was going to Cuba, not, not, not Europe. When it came back, I went aboard, but I was in the brig uh, in Newport until it cut back. Those are the things that, you know, it's, it's not uh, patriotic and stuff like that. It's just things that happen to you. you know, so if you're thinking of going to service, you're always going to run into guys that are uh, trying, to, trying to do, think they're, they're you know, on, you're, you're working, you're an underling. You're, you have to jump when I tell you to jump. You don't have to. Not anymore, anyway. So, so do you think that they treated you well? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I was treated very good. Captain of the ship, the, uh, uh, most of the officers treated me well, fine. Everybody stayed away from me. I don't know. I, I, I looked like mafia, I guess. <laughs> they knew I was Italian, so they probably just stayed the hell for whatever reason. But I was treated good. There was only one black guy that uh, was a kind of a cramp that came from the South that didn't like me. But, you know, after, after a while, his, we got our problem resolved and he stayed the hell away from me. But how, the, how was uh, life on the boat? Did you have, you know, a, a specific job that you had to do to upkeep the boat? Well, you know, under, when you're underway, there's no painting or no, nothing going on the ship. You're just, uh, we were, I was in charge of, of a depth charge rack. So if we had to do, uh, uh, you know, on the back of the ship, there's, there's rows of depth charges. 
and there's about six or four clusters around like that with the, with the guns and all that. And I was in, in charge of this particular role, but during the day, you, you walked around, there was no work, because you, when you're in the way, you can't, because you can wash the overboard. We, we did lose a couple of guys. Uh, and the, when we went over, we were with a wasp, the carrier wasp. We were out in the middle of the, of the ocean, and there was a ship, this Hobson, it's called the Hobson. It was, uh, we had the plane guard duty that day there. So uh, we were following the carrier, again, for the torpedo thing. And the Hobson jumped the position on us and got up in front of us. I don't know why. They had a bunch of people on there that were kind of follow-ups on the ship worse than I was. The, what happens is a carrier can turn at right angles in the middle of the ocean, just without a breeze. But a destroyer, in order to turn, you'll hear it scream, and it's got an angle trying to make a curve. because And the screws are going. You could hear them screaming, trying to keep up. The Hobson got in front of the Wasp. Wasp cut it in half. Uh, the guys who were on the bridge... Uh, were the only ones that got out of it. There was about 90 guys that just went down with it. Uh, during the day, we lost, uh, we were transferring. What we do is carry, the destroyers go alongside each other, and we transfer movies back and forth. They have movies that we want to see, we give them that. In doing this here, one of the guys on the hops had got his foot caught in a rope and went overboard. We searched for him for about four or five hours. Finally, some guy pulls the line in around 6 o'clock, and the guy is attached to the end of the line. And... After that is the episode where it sunk the whole ship after that. So those are things that you don't hear in the, when, you, when you want to join the service. Nobody tells you about that. There's a lot of danger. A lot of danger in there. Oh, I believe it. Why is it called plane guard? I thought that I was always under the impression that torpedoes came from under the water. Right. Did they come from Right. Planes? But we, any planes coming in, we shoot them. How about the, uh, the kamikaze planes? We're there shooting them. We have, we have, you have guns all over these ships. And that's what we do. Uh, it's plane guard because it's a position where, you, where when, the, when the aircraft, can, when the planes are taking off, you're going alongside. When you're refueling, and you're just refueling. But that's basically it. the torpedo part of it is is it, it just uh, how do you say it? That's automatic. You know, that's 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 automatically known that that's what you're there to do if a torpedo. But underway, when you're when you're in uh, flight stuff like that, it's called plane guard. You're guarding the planes. All the ships are basically guarding the carriers. So were you ever shot at? Did you ever shoot down a plane? No. You never had to do anything no. like that? I was never in a war zone that I know of. No. Are you happy about that, or do you wish that you I was in a bit shot at? Oh, I'm, I'm glad. How would you like to be shot at? I wouldn't like it at all, but I feel like if I were in, in the war, I don't know. I really have mixed feelings, but I don't know. I could I can't speak on that because I haven't been in the war. Well, ask Jonathan that when he comes. Jonathan was a CB. Okay. He'll be here this afternoon. Ask those guys. He he was more you know the the, the fear. There's a lot of fear, you know. But uh, I was a stupid young kid. As eight, what the hell? I was 18 years old. You know, I got I was out of out of working in a restaurant, and you don't think of anything, you know. If you make the wrong move, you could be in the ocean and everybody's gone. It's, that's it. You're you're done. You know, it's it's a it's a dangerous area on a ship because of the waves that come over. You never know when you're going to get hit with a big wave. So there were casualties with the waves, but none in combat. Well, we you, we lost the, that one guy from uh, transferring uh, uh, the rope, but that was an accident. Okay. So you were never a prisoner of war or any no. of that. Um, did you ever get any medals or citations? No, not that I know of. Okay. I was lucky they didn't throw me overboard. So you, uh, you did sustain an injury, right? No. I have a, I had a heart murmur when I went in. Okay. And it aggravated it. Oh, okay. Being on the ship aggravated it, and I was 100% uh, disabled. Uh, I got out. I wasn't on it. I got out with 10% disability. They figured I was 10% disabled because... Uh, you know, I could have a heart attack on the ship. And what, what are you going to do? There's a whole hospital on the destroyer. If, if you're out in the fleet, they transfer you to the carrier and stuff like that, but they can't do open heart surgery out there. So they figured, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking on their side. They just figured, let's discharge the guy, and they don't have to worry about it. How was it like um, 
staying in touch with your family, like, you know, outside of your direct interaction with, um, you know, your crewmates or your commanders? How is that? Uh, I didn't. I didn't write very much. I wrote to my sister. We're uh, we were we were a loving family. We loved each other, but we're at arm's length. It's it's in the restaurant when you're in a business. It's a lot different. Everybody is a worker, you know, and nobody is higher up than anybody. And everybody, I peel potatoes, you know, in the restaurant. And that's why I went into service to get away from that stuff. But uh, on board ship, it was the same thing. Everybody, the officers and everything. You know, I, I call my first name. I Even now, I do that now. I, like uh, Roger Johnson, he's the director. You, should, you know, I should give him more respect, call him Mr. Durham, but I don't. Because my, as a salesman, I was good at everything I did. And it's a one-in-one -one thing with me. If, if, if I'm selling you something, I want to understand. That's why what we're doing right now. I want to talk to the person and see what he product he want, what he did, and what he expected out of it. And, you know, what, he, what I expected out of him, I would give him the same return. So that's how I, I ran my life. Could you, could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit when you were selling what you were selling, uh, where you were selling them, where you were selling them to? I, the, let's see, the first job I had, I worked at Dola Madison, which is Winchester's in New Haven. We built uh, the cores of nuclear reactors. Uh, you heard of the Nautilus, the first submarine, first nuclear submarine, we did that core. And I was responsible for testing it, the you know, contamination. In other words, you go in and you measure the radiation that's coming out of it. You don't want any if you can help it. That was the worst core that I ever saw. I got on, they installed it on the Nautilus, and it didn't last a month. They took it off and threw it out. It was so bad. The other reactor cores were flat, different type of cores. So uh, the next job from there, where did I go from there? I went to work at, at A.W. Hayden in electronics. We did the... Uh, Timers and things, which is right up the street here in Waterbury. You know, I worked for them for quite a few years. I, I left A.W. Hayden. We, we tried to go to Florida. Uh, I was an electronic technician. I went to, I graduated my alumni University of Hartford. But I started, when I went, it was Hillier College uh, in downtown New Haven on Ward, uh, Ward Street there. Uh, I, I did two years during the day. I was working in a restaurant then. And I had to quit, but, but thank God for the instructor I had, Mr. Pratt, talked me into coming back at night and finishing, because I got married. I said, you know, I, I've got to take care of a, a wife and maybe a family. But he talked me into it, and I finished. It was a three-year thing. So uh, now I'm, uh, I was an electronic engineer for the company. I was in charge of field service. Uh, this is Danbury, this is data control systems. And what we made there was telemetry systems for uh, uh, all of anybody in the country. The, the two big telemetry systems we had. Now, Nick Rahal, who was a prisoner of war, was a good friend. We worked there. He was, he's, he's with an Arab. Uh, he's from Lebanon. We built a system for the, uh, for the uh, Israelis and one for the Saudi Arabia. Two identical systems. And they were there to monitor each other. You know, and we would be there laughing and saying, these guys are next door to each other. And, you know, what the heck's going on? Uh, Nick was a gentleman because he talked to the Israelis and they, they loved him. You know, he was, uh, there, was, there was no hate in anything we did. And uh, the systems we worked on, I worked for RCA. I've been uh, to every, every government facility. I saw the, uh, the, the, jet, the jet engines for the uh, astronaut things down in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I, I was there. Can't hear when you're talking in there with that. I had technicians all over the country that were under me at data controls. Then I went out on my own. That's the, uh, when I became the chairman of the board of the Million Dollar Club, that was at U.S. Instrument Rentals. It was a selling uh, electronic instrumentation. It was a new way of doing things. So uh, I used to sell to your school. Your school was uh, one of the big customers for really? when I first started. And I, you know, that's how I became, I just, no matter where I went, I had, uh, my territory was covered from uh, New England, uh, up, up New York State, and that, that was it, just about, except for Massachusetts, I think. We had, uh, we had a guy in Massachusetts, I think, I didn't cover that area there. But uh, it was, uh, you get up in the morning, Monday morning, get in the car, and you come back Friday night. So, you know, I was married, I had kids in those days. 
it was, but it, it was probably for my wife more than me, you know, because I'm a bold BS artist. So, you know, I go out and talk to people and I become friendly with them. It's a lonely life to be a salesman on the road because, you, you know, you don't, you don't have a girlfriend everywhere and you really, you know, with me, I'm leery of having girl, too many girlfriends or having any girlfriends at all because you don't know what the hell you, they want to own you after a while. I don't want that. So I, I, I did what I did. Uh, I was very successful in sales. Then I came home and went to, what, what else did I do? Boy, I can't remember it. At 80 years old, you can't remember anything. Aiden, uh, Winchester, Data Controls. Oh, I worked for uh, Prentice, a company out in, in uh, San Jose, and we sold modems. What a modem is basically is your telephone. Yeah. That's the internet nowadays. I worked with the internet at uh, uh, where, where, you know, up in up in Lexington, Mass. The internet was originated there. DRS, Diagnostic Retrieval Company. They started the. They had a building the size of this floor, this floor here, and they had the, all this equipment and stuff in there. And they had nurses working there. They had guys that were in construction. They had guys doing everything under the sun. And I asked them, what's the product line? What kind of a company is it? Their company deals in information, and that's it. And they are, it, was, it was strictly for the government at that point in time. I held the top, I always held top security clearance. Uh, the FBI came to my neighborhood and investigated me around there, all my neighbors. But uh, the things that we did, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. What the heck? Did, what, what are the things that could have got involved in? You're not supposed to divulge certain things, and we we never did. You know, we didn't ask. I didn't ask, and they didn't ask. But I dealt with all the, all the Air Air Force uh, Air, uh, research centers and stuff that uh, cats with the doctors. I told tape recorder. I worked for Sangamo Electric Company. That's the other company out of Illinois selling tape recorders. And a lot of that was for research. We did it. I worked very heavily with the doctors in New York City, Long Island, and stuff like that. And you'd go in and they'd have these animals, dogs, cats, and everything. And they'd have their heads removed. They had a monkey with his head at Columbia University. And he's in a chair. And the recorder was next to it. And I had to work on it. That monkey was screaming, trying to grab me all the time I was there. And they were trying to, they were trying to prove or find out brain damage. So this poor monkey's there, and they're poking him in the brain to see what the hell uh, kind of damage they could cause to him. This thing is screaming. And I think after they were through it, they put his head, put his cap back on, and gave him back to the guy that gave him to him. You know, the cats, there was one woman that was a doctor in research in a uh, uh, Jewish hospital out there. And she had a beautiful collie. She loved it, she says, but she couldn't keep it. She was something wrong where she was. So she gave the collie for research, but she didn't want to stay in there with it. She gave it to the guys to work on. And the, the doctors used to laugh. They, these, they were uh, very uneducated people that were cutting these animals apart. And they said, oh, this is your future doctors. And I'm looking at them. I said, you can't you be kidding. I said, such guys can't even speak English. <laughs> then after, I, after a while, I realized they were just, they were just working there. So what, uh, where and when did your service end? Uh, 19, it ended in Newport, Rhode Island. They gave me $343. They brought me to the gate and they said, go ahead, you're all, that's it, you're done, go. Didn't give me any transportation, so I had to either hitchhike or catch, catch a bus from there to go home. And that was it. That was in 1953 sometime. It's in the, on the discharge. Okay. If you want to look at it, you'll see it. Did you go straight home? Uh, yeah. yeah, I didn't know where else we go. Where did they discharge you? Newport, Rhode Island, at the gate. They threw me out the gate. <laughs> it's like taking you to an old farm, and there's the gate. Go. Were you excited to be home? Was your family excited? Well, I had to go back to work again. I got I went back to what I went away from, for my father. And uh, through Johnny Bly, whose pictures in those folders, uh, I met uh, Carol, my wife, who was here from Waterbury. She was a nurse. She was St. Mary's nurse. And we fell in love and got married. That was 80, uh, 58 years ago. Our anniversary was uh, the 24th of uh, November. 
married to the same woman 58 years. I didn't even think I was going that long, let alone be married. So did you, um, you went to school after you got discharged, right? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 got, I went to uh, the Ward School of Electronics. I was, a, I was a senior, when I went into service, I was a senior at Hill House in New Haven, when Hill House was part of Yale. And uh, I come out, uh, I got a GED, I guess. I think I did get one, but I figured let's, let me try you know, get some more education because you know, we're, I'm not going to go work in another restaurant after I leave my father. What he expected us to do was, when he died, we take over the restaurant. And I wasn't interested. My brother, I had brother and sister. Neither one of us were interested in it. Was your education paid for by the military? Yes. Um, tell me about some close friendships that you made during the uh, during your service, and do you still stay in touch with them? Do they live close to you? I don't. I didn't have that many close to friends. I had friends. I had one in Bridgeport. Lasted for about a couple of years. Uh, Johnny Bly and Colby were the two closest here in Waterbury, but uh, Johnny was close because yeah, I married him. He, he was going out with my wife's girlfriend, so uh, and Johnny was the closest. Wally Colby, he's still here. He's still alive. He's We know each other, but we're not that close. So how did your service um, in the military, how does that influence your views on today's, um, you know, war and the military today? Well, I, uh, they're, they're terrible. You know, the biggest problem we have, uh, war is terrible, no matter when the hell it is or what it's about. Uh, there's always somebody who's greedy that wants to start a war. When you've got something I want. But, uh, you know, the people that get hurt are the people that are on the street. You know, you don't, you don't help it. You, you get prejudices because this guy was, was this nationality, the other nationality there. Uh, wars are terrible. You know, there's nothing good you can say about it. And you got to look at it from both sides. You know, you go into war, I would be, I'd feel terrible if you got killed in the war. Now, you get a guy from the other side that's your age, the same thing. Now, they feel the same way about him. You know, so it's, it's the families that are involved with the people that are the, the soldiers, they feel terrible when they're, 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 they're can or killed. You know, and if the, one of the things you, you, you had to learn that I found out from the Army was when you're in the Army and you come cross, face to face with a German, you shoot. You don't hesitate. If you hesitate, you're dead. Now, you can look at these kids and their kids younger than you, some of them, and you got to shoot them. And, you know, after that, you're almost sick. I, I would imagine you'd be sick. I'd be sick. I couldn't really, I couldn't shoot anybody. We're Italians. We're, I'm from Naples. We're lovers. We don't we don't shoot or fight. We throw the rifles down and chase women. <laughs> so did you did you really believe in the purpose of being in the Korean War? I had no idea what the purpose was there for. No idea. You know, other other than uh, yeah, I, I, I take that back. That the uh, North Koreans tried to overrun uh, a, a populace of people of their nation that were free. They live like we do. Uh, biggest, the biggest thing to, to try to understand out of any war, especially if you're an American, is, you know, how, why do these people have to answer to everybody, everything they do? You know, if I want to buy something, I got to ask permission. If I want to go there to, to school, I got to get permission from the government and people like that. Uh, this country here, we're, 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 we're spoiled. You're a very spoiled, your generation is worse than ours. You've got these things, these phones. You know, we didn't have those. We had to dial telephones. I had, when I first started, we had to pick the telephone up and ho, 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 and then ask for somebody on the telephone. Mm -hmm. The electronics, uh, we tube type electronics. I got started with in, in Danbury, and then we went into a solid state. But to your, gener your generation is a, and the next generation, you know, uh, God forbid that uh, we start fighting over technology in the future. Uh, hopefully, it, it, it'll be a more friendly world. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can overpopulate the world. Then when you overpopulate it, it's a fight over food. Who's going to, you know, I want some food. You're not going to give me any. I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. um, are you a member of any veteran organization? The Stable American Veterans. That's the only organization I belong to. Okay. I don't have, 
I would, if they want me to join the American Legion, they want me to join the VFW. But I said, no, I, you know, I'm dedicated to the disabled veterans to get these, de de these kids that come out from the service that are, that are either shot, wounded, or whatnot, uh, have no idea where to go for benefits. And that's my job. I got mine. I'm 100%. So, you know, I, I get good money. These kids need theirs and they need to go. That's why you'll see uh, we hold our meetings. I put ads in the paper and I give out cards. Call me and I will direct you how to get and who to go to for information. There's a special gen gentleman called Alan Gumpenberger who worked for DAV at, uh, as a service officer. Then he quit, went on his own. And Alan is, is the Cadillac in the industry for getting benefits for uh, if anybody ever feels they want to uh, help, call me or go to Alan. How do the benefits work? Is it like a paycheck every week? Every month. Every month? I, and like 100% means fully disabled. Fully disabled. Uh, you, no, you know, you, yeah, you, 100% determines the amount of money you get. And that's the maximum amount you can get is 100%. A lot of these guys, like Jonathan, you'll find they're 150%, 200% disabled. But they won't pay them beyond, uh, beyond 100%, which is fine. You know, my question to the congressman and the uh, uh, SDNEs here is, how come they're not paid the same way we are? Why do they have special uh, benefits and monies and stuff like that? They have a different pocket uh, that they get paid out. Why aren't they under Medicare? If they were everything would run a lot smoother. If everybody had to be on the Medicaid, and now you'd be damn sure that the Congress would make sure it was right. That's, that's diverting from it. Go ahead. That's, did you run out of time? That long? I think that you've done, yeah, you've done great. Um, did you ever, you know, I just have a few more questions. What was there to do on the boat when, uh, you know, you needed something for entertainment? Did you keep a journal? Were there performances? You said that you watched movies. Yeah, they had movies on a fan tale. Only when you were tied up. You're not under, not underway. Underway, it was nothing to do. Underway, it was the, uh, the, the ship was the important thing, making sure everything was right and nothing, nothing broke loose. That's go around watching things that are loose or something. But uh, when you're underway, it's 24 hours a day. No sleeping? Well, yeah, you go to sleep. You, have, you go in shifts. You have, uh, you have a night crew. Everybody, there's always somebody uh, awake. So was there a bed for everyone, or did you share a bed? No, we, we shared a bed. <laughs> we had the, the it, I was in a fantasy. I got, believe it or not, I was born in New Haven. I loved the water. I swam all my life, never got sick. I went into the Navy, I got sick. I went up on the bridge, the old one deck, and I puked all over the, the, the guns of the, uh, Wally Colby, boy, do you admit. But uh, you, you get seasick in the Navy. There's no place to go hide. The only place is a fan tail. The back of the ship, because of the way it runs, it's, it's, it's smooth. It don't, there's none of this choppy stuff. That's what gets you sick. So when, when you're in the way, there's really nothing. You just have a, uh, an assigned spot you're at, and that's it. How was the food? It was all right. We had turkey one year. And uh, <laughs> I was working, uh, I don't know if I was being punished or not, but I was uh, bringing the food down from the kitchen, huge, huge trays of food. And it was Thanksgiving, we had turkey. And all of a sudden, the turkey was contaminated. And they, had, they, they just threw it all overboard. The only turkey that was good was in one thing that I had. I had a big platter. And as I was going down the stairs, the grease... When I, you go down an, an iron ladder straight down to put the food on. And, they, and when I went down, I slipped off the ladder. The, the, the bucket went flying. One of the legs came flying up, and I grabbed the leg. In the air, I was the only one that ate turkey. <laughs> and the rest of it, we had to throw them out. Oh, no. Other than that, the food is, you know, it's, it's nothing special. You don't, get, you don't get steak and stuff like that. So is there anything else that you'd like to add to the conversation to the interview? Anything that you'd like us to know that I haven't asked you? Well, just, uh, you know, if you're going to go into service, think seriously about it. It's not, it's, it's not uh, another adventure. It's uh, going to a branch that you can do something good for the people, for the guys in there. And if, even if you become an officer, 
you're in charge. You know, you got a bunch of guys that are really screwing up all the time. Uh, you can't, you know, you'd like to throw them in jail all the time. And, and that's the guy I ran into to, to court martial me. Uh, everybody has problems. Just think of the guy, you know, don't, don't make him do things that you wouldn't do. Probably the best thing. For, and this, not only on the ship, and the Navy, this is your whole life. Yeah. You know, when you're dealing with people, you want to be good. As, if you want to go into sales, you've got to understand that uh, you're selling a product to somebody that his, his, his livelihood depends on you. So what you do for him, uh, once you sell it to him, most of the guys that I knew, they sold him the product and they went away. They disappeared. They, uh, I would get called and a lot of the competitors because I knew how the product worked. And I would help them, especially down in Grumman with, uh, with the astronauts and things like that. I was also involved with the engineers on the Thresher, which is a nuclear submarine out of, uh, was out of, out of uh, not, it was a Newport, no, it was out of here, Connecticut, uh, the nuclear stuff, and uh, the reactor. We had, I, they wanted me to go on board, but I was claustrophobic. I couldn't take submarines. Didn't go on it, and one of the engineers, they, it didn't go on it. The, the uh, whole crew, the sub was gone. It didn't, it sank because of something that happened, I don't know. But uh, things like that happen. You got friends that you work with that are very close, and you're going to do that all your life. If they get killed or something like that, you just can't stop your life there and say, you know, the world is wrong. You, you, you feel very bad for what happened, but you move on. You know, you just go help the next guy that needs help. Find somebody that needs help. That's the way to keep you out of trouble. That keeps your mind occupied on, on, on somebody else instead of you. Well, thank you stay you out of the service. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Tom. That was great. Well, thank you.